We've all made mistakes in our lives, done things we look back on with regret, maybe wishing there was some kind of way of making it right. My Name is Earl takes an average scumbag and gives him a mission to do just that, and in turn gives us a blueprint on how to make amends for wrongdoing and making the world a better place in the process. Running for a mere four seasons, My Name is Earl was a smash hit when it debuted, only to be unceremoniously cancelled after its fourth season. In that short time, it won several awards and grew a small cult following. Earl Hickey and his journey of redemption through the cartoonish world of Camden County gave audiences a crash course in karma, revealing the simplicity of doing good, and it gave us one of the greatest mustaches in TV history. The story of My Name is Earl begins with Greg Garcia. Before creating the series, Garcia had written for shows such as Family Matters and On Our Own. He then went on to co-create the sitcom Yes Dear for CBS. Garcia came up with an idea for a show starring a less-than-savory character trying to make up for all the wrong he had done in his life, partially inspired by parts of Garcia's own personal history. My father, or uh, stepfather, uh, is named Earl. He wasn't the best guy in the world. He, uh, he, he was somewhat of a, a crook. I don't think he was as bad as uh, some of the things Earl has done, but uh, he kind of uh, saw the light and started to change his ways and uh, didn't officially make a list, but he went around and uh, kind of made up for some of the things he he's done, and uh, he's continuing to do that. So he's really inspired me. Garcia pitched the show to Fox, thinking it would be a good fit for the network, but ultimately passed on the pilot script. That script found its way to NBC, and while they initially wanted Garcia to create a whole new series for them, he suggested that instead they take the existing script and turn it into a series. And so My Name is Earl was born. Early on, director Mark Buckland was attached to the project and became a big part of the look of the series. He and Garcia were on the same page about wanting My Name is Earl to look cinematic. We just said, you know, this thing really should look like a movie every week. For the show to move forward, it had to assemble the right cast, and the crucial first step was finding the right person to play Earl. Partially because NBC really wanted him on their network, Jason Lee was an early favorite to play Earl. Lee had mostly worked in movies at this point, and back in 2005, it was a lot less common to see actors moving from the big screen to the small one. The strength of the pilot script convinced Lee to take the part. This is something that I would see in a film, if done right. And if done right, it would be up my alley. The kind of movie I would want to be and I would want to watch. Earl was a former dirtbag turned good guy, and Lee brought an easy charm to the character that made the audience root for him on his journey. Lee also had the brilliant idea of giving Earl his signature mustache. And he said, you know what? He goes, I look really funny with a mustache. He goes, trust me, a mustache would be hilarious. And he was right. The iconic look was originally something they had to fight the network on, but... For all our sake, sanity eventually prevailed, and Earl Hickey was born. You got great boobs, Peggy. Her name was not Peggy. Ethan Suffley was an early consideration for the role of Randy Hickey, Earl's brother. Although Lee and Suffley had been friends for a while, having worked on a number of projects over the years, that wasn't how Suffley ended up in consideration for the role. And the story and the characters were hysterical. My wife is a manager, and she said, what the hell are you reading? And I said, I'm reading My Name is Earl. And she said, that's Jason's show. And I was like, what? It was a complete surprise to Suppley when he found out that he was in the running for a series starring his longtime friend, and their on-screen chemistry made for an easy fit. Randy is a man of many strange talents and a unique perspective. Although not the most intellectually gifted of people, he does have a good heart and remains Earl's most loyal friend. Randy, those are poison. How poison? The role of Joy, Earl's ex-wife, very quickly went to Jamie Presley. According to Presley, it was basically given to her at the audition. I went in there like, so when do we start shooting? <laughs> it's hard to imagine anyone else as the hard-as-nails yet somehow charming trailer park terror. Although Joy and Earl didn't have the best marriage, they did manage to become friends after it ended. At least, they did eventually. You are not the one standing with the freshly broken bottle now, are you? Well, this will still hurt if I hit you with it. Eddie Steeples caught the eye of Greg Garcia after his appearance in a number of commercials, specifically his role as the rubber band man in a series of Office Max ad spots. Steeples played Darnell Turner, also known as Harry Monroe, more on that later, and affectionately nicknamed Crab Man. Darnell is Joy's love interest and eventual new husband. The perpetual face of chill, Darnell is the yin to her yang, though his calm demeanor hides a mysterious past. Hi, Earl. Hey, Crab Man. Joy wanted me to bring you these poison cookies. Huh? I wasn't gonna get involved, but now she got me delivering poison. It just don't seem right. 
The last person to join the principal cast was Nadine Velasquez, playing Catalina Ruca, the maid in the motel Earl and Randy live in. Velasquez actually gave up being part of the series Prison Break, where she would have played the character Maricruz Delgado, so she could instead be a part of My Name is Earl. Catalina brings a bit of flavor to the cast, offering a friend to support Earl and Randy, while also being a foil to Joy. There you go. Now if you do it to the other hand, I want to take you to my church so I can watch all the old ladies cry. When the show came together, it tested surprisingly well with audiences, in spite of the fact that its single-camera style was a relatively new thing for a network sitcom at the time. Those early positive signs even led NBC to give out advanced previews of the pilot to people via a CD-ROM that was inserted into magazines. Something that is absolutely a relic of the era this show came from. My Name is Earl premiered on a Tuesday night and brought with it some high hopes that it would be a hit. And it was an instant success. Straight from Carson Daly's lips to my morphine-laced ear. Debuting on Tuesday, September 20th, 2005, with an episode titled Pilot, My Name is Earl waved hello to the world. The opening minutes of the show established the premise in short order. Earl is not a good guy. Sort of shifty looking fella who buys a pack of smokes, a couple lotto scratchers, and a tall boy at 10 in the morning. He's married to a woman who got him drunk enough to marry her, even though she was six months pregnant with another man's child. Joy didn't remember much about the boy's real father, except that he drove a Ford. So we named him Dodge. A year later, she gave birth to another son, though Earl suspects this one wasn't his either. There he was. Earl Jr. Earl's life changes forever, though, when he wins $100,000 in the lotto. And he's then hit by a car and loses the scratcher. I'm rich! $100,000, sucker! <laughs> Joy soon leaves Earl for Darnell, the real father of her second son. And while Earl is stuck in a hospital bed, wondering why his life is so miserable, Earl learns about a little thing called karma. If you do good things and good things happen to you, you do bad things and it'll come back to haunt you. Karma. Karma. There it was. Having been kicked out of the trailer by Joy, Earl and Randy are living at a motel. They make a new friend in Catalina, and Earl announces his new plan in life, to make a list of every person he's wronged and then try to somehow make it up to them. I almost died because something good happened to me that I didn't deserve. That karma stuff is going to kill me unless I make up for everything on that list. As if karma is smiling down on him, the lottery scratcher returns and Earl has $100,000 he can use to fund his new quest to make all his wrongs right. The rest of the episode has Earl going on his first task, making amends with one of his former bullying victims, Kenny, played by Greg Binkley. He decides for this one, he needs to get Kenny laid. Only, Kenny has a secret. We live in a small town, and I've never been face to face with a gay before. I understand now the running probably wasn't necessary. This is where the show starts to get more interesting. If all Earl was doing in this series was traveling around doing good deeds, it wouldn't be much of a show. From the pilot, we're getting a few key elements about what makes this series so special. Earl isn't just here to help Kenny. He has to help himself by getting past his own homophobia. If you like... men, why don't you uh, have a man? To help get Kenny out of the closet, Earl takes him to a gay bar, and the experience is so transformative for Kenny that he lets Earl know he can cross him off his list. The one man I was the most scared of in my whole life has accepted me as I am. You took away my confidence, but today you gave it back. This episode offered a very lovely portrait of how to make amends to a person. It begins with Earl realizing he's done something wrong. He then goes to make amends. He learns about who his victim is as a person and what unique way he can offer some form of restitution. And then his victim tells Earl when he's done enough. It's a form of justice that focuses on the restitution towards the wrong party rather than punishing the aggressor. And there were so many other important facts established in the pilot. Earl finding the lottery ticket he lost, and still sticking with his list, establishes that this mission is something Earl is going to be on for a while. He's not just doing it for the sake of getting that one lottery ticket back. And by helping someone else, Earl also helped make himself a better person, overcoming the homophobia of his past self. Something we'll see in later episodes is Kenny coming to Earl's help when he needs it in the future, as the series reveals over time, while Earl views it as a personal mission, this journey has consequences for all of Camden. Earl is a flawed guy, but he's made lovable by wanting to do better. He's also limited in that he's not suddenly a master of ethical living. But this doesn't somehow stop him from being a decent person. Karma is a simple, but very effective way of living a better life. Something anyone can take on, even Earl. The pilot was a huge hit, being watched by nearly 15 million people. 
A fun fact about this episode is that it also includes an appearance by the series creator, Greg Garcia. He's the guy Randy dances with at the gay bar. Over the years, there would be a number of cameos like this from Garcia and other members of the staff on the show, but this one was particularly fun. In the DVD set for the first season, there was also an alternate version of the pilot, Bad Karma, that was included. Instead of Carson Daly, Earl listens to Stewie Griffin from Family Guy go on a short rant and takes this to heart instead. So instead of making a list of people he's wronged, Earl makes a list of vengeance and decides to be even worse than he had been before. If I want to sleep good at night, I need to start getting revenge. What's this? I made a list of everyone who's ever screwed me over. Why? Why? Randy, I just won $100,000 in the lottery and was immediately hit by a car. If I don't start fighting back, I'm nothing but a punk. I can't hold my head up until I pay back everyone on that list. Much of the pilot's events are inverted, like Earl attacking Joy and Darnell instead of Joy attacking him when she finds out he won the lottery. And Earl tries to manipulate Kenny, thinking that he's straight, into having sex with a prostitute who has a penis. The episode ends with Earl being hit by a car, and this time, a very upset Joy and Darnell, left bald by Earl's attack, decide to finish him off for good, leaving Randy to become the star of the series. My name is Randy. This episode is a cute little extra, and it's also notable for being the one time we see Jason Lee playing Earl with a fake mustache and sideburns. Absolutely criminal. I'm just trying to be a better person. My name is Earl. Earl's growth can be summarized very easily as a simple man making himself and his community better through good deeds. In the second episode, Quit Smoking, Earl tries to make up for getting his friend Donnie arrested. Only Donnie found religion in jail and he forgives Earl, but Donnie wasn't the only victim, and Earl finds that he needs to make up for the two years Donnie's mother lost with her son. So to make things square, he helps Donnie's mother quit smoking so she'll have some extra time with him. I know you're scared to give up the smokes, so am I. We're gonna get through this together. This is the sweetest, most justified kidnapping I've ever seen. While smoking is likely not as easy to quit as the montage makes it to be, or at least give quitting a fighting chance like the montage suggests, this little story reflects how Earl realizes his actions have hurt people outside of his list. The bad Earl did often spilled out and had a greater impact than he thought, but the same is true of the good. This list item helped Earl get healthier and Donnie and his mother have more time to spend together. Three people helped with one good deed. The important lesson, and one we see throughout the series, is that everyone and everything is connected to something else and one good deed or one bad deed can ripple out to affect an entire community. By choosing to do good instead of bad, this is how Earl is making his community a better place. There's also a wonderful feedback loop that shows us that by doing good and becoming a better person, Earl is able to take on more challenging tasks and having an increased impact in his community. Earl is effectively becoming a greater force for change as the series progresses, and Earl's commitment to karma is tested through an increasingly heavy load. This is how Earl makes himself better. In the season one finale, number one, Earl attempts to cross off the first thing on his list. It was the last bad thing he ever did before getting hit by a car. Stole $10 from a guy at a convenience store. Only he finds out that that guy was going to use $10 to buy the winning lottery ticket that Earl bought instead. So Earl has to give the guy his lottery money. Having lost his lottery winnings, Earl puts his faith in karma to care for him and Randy. And that often takes the shape of his friends helping him out. Now, I know you don't have any money to buy beers, but two ladies just left the bar and they ain't finished these. Here's napkins to wipe off the lipstick. Thanks, crab man. Even with his money gone, Earl keeps working on the list. Then he loses his car, and he keeps working on the list. And it even looks like he might be losing Randy. And he still keeps on working on the list. He learns that the man Earl originally stole that $10 from was ruined by the lottery winnings. I have a feeling that if I keep it, it's gonna kill me. Money's supposed to be with you. There's an almost mystical quality to the experience, as if this money can only be used to do good for others. This episode also raised the important point of how sometimes doing good can feel like you're going backwards, but if you stay on track, things will work out, and friends can help you along the way. The audio commentary reflected this very important part of the series. Like, if this were to happen during the pilot, he'd be so confused, he wouldn't know how the hell to handle this. But he has a good idea now. He really does believe in it. Earl at the beginning of the season likely would have bailed the moment his money vanished and gone back to his thieving ways. But doing good deeds for a year has changed him. It's not just about the reward, but also the experience. He still believes karma will make his life better, but not in the way he might have at the beginning. Earl's capacity to do good and the power of good deeds are a major force driving him forward throughout the seasons. What Earl can do for others expands as more people do good alongside him. 
Earl's approach to doing good deeds is never very complicated. He's aware that he's a work in progress, and that by doing good, he's working on making himself better. It's perhaps best summed up at the end of the season 1 episode titled, The Professor. It's the feeling I get when I cross something off my list that reminds me I'm going in the right direction. And each day, I'm getting a little closer to the kind of man I want to be. How can you not root for this guy? These little moments are never very complicated, and that's part of Earl's charm. He's a simple guy, and doing good doesn't have to be a complicated thing. In the season 2 episode, Robbed a Stoner Blind, Earl is faced with a deep dilemma when Woody, played by Christian Slater, teaches him about climate change. Because of warming, deadly diseases like West Nile are spreading like wildfire and will kill you. And do you want to die a virgin? Sorry, that's in there for the high school kids, really shakes him up. As Earl realizes this is going to require him to do a lot more than change his personal habits, he starts to feel overwhelmed by the problem. You're trying to take on too much, man. You can't fix everything out there. Your list is your destiny. That's how you're going to change the world. Climate change is beyond the power of a former thief on a mission to underdo his wrongdoings. The episode saying Earl just needs to repay the Earth in a small way is a decent enough message. But what rings particularly true here is that, for Earl, thinking on some kind of grand scale to fix the planet is not something he needs to do. What we're learning here is that, instead of being bogged down in grand ethical debates on how we live our lives, how it impacts every other organism on the planet, Earl can do good just by following his list, and by doing that, it reveals how doing good is really a simple thing. That's another theme that runs through the series. It's not that worrying about big problems is a bad thing, it's that doing good doesn't require exclusively fixating on those heavier burdens. As long as someone is still making some kind of small step to help with those bigger problems, and spending the rest of their time doing good in other, more immediate ways. The series isn't about wrestling with massive ethical conundrums. For instance, is it more moral to adopt a stray cat or donate your time to help a soup kitchen? The answer in this series is that it's not an either-or question. You do the one that makes the most sense to you. It's the doing that matters the most. In the season 4 episode, Sweet Johnny, we see a great example of that when Earl tries to make amends with a local stuntman named Sweet Johnny, played by David Arquette only to learn that Sweet Johnny has a brain injury that prevents him from forming new memories, so Earl can never really make up for the fact that he slept with Sweet Johnny's girlfriend. Though he keeps trying, eventually Earl realizes why he's trying so hard. I was really only trying to make me feel better by crossing Johnny off the list. For the first time since I started doing my list, I wasn't going to be able to cross somebody off. I was going to have to just let it nag at me. But since Johnny was never going to remember, it felt right that someone never forget. A guilty conscience is not something that is always a thing you can get rid of, but good deeds are always something a person can do. It may not make things right, but it can serve as a permanent reminder to be a better person. It's a very deep lesson for such a simple guy, and it's how the whole process of doing good shows the evolution of Earl. He becomes a better person and learns about the limitations of those good works, and even though he can't make everything right, that's no excuse not to do the good he can. And importantly, with Earl learning these lessons, it reveals that anyone can learn them alongside him. Although Earl is trying to be a better person, what's inescapable is that he isn't quite there yet, and that often gets revealed in some less-than-enlightened moments throughout the series. The aforementioned homophobia from the pilot is a great example, because it not only highlights a problem of Earl's, but also how he corrects it. It was put succinctly by Jamie Presley in the audio commentary for the season one episode, White Lie Christmas. That's what I love about our show, though, is that it's politically incorrect and then it corrects itself. <laughs> in a really twisted way. In a really twisted yeah, way. Right. Mm -hmm. Even though the show's humor bordered on the offensive at times, it didn't get a lot of pushback from the audience. In another audio commentary, this time in the season one episode, Oh Karma, Where Art Thou?, we hear how that that's why the show didn't get as much anger directed towards it for its more offensive moments. Have you gotten letters from any particular community? Okay. You seem to be Definitely. equal opportunity in, as far as... Yeah. If we have, I haven't seen them yet, yeah. I was kind of expecting some stuff, but... What about the GLAD thing? That was a good thing, right? We won a GLAD award. You yeah, did? For the pilot, for the pilot, we won a GLAD award. The show, on occasion, also has its cake and eats it too by having Earl do all sorts of horrible things in extended flashback sequences, sometimes nearly lasting the whole episode, to then see him making up for it in the present. This makes the whole journey feel more real. Rather than everything take place within the narrow time frame of a few days, like on most other sitcoms, going back several years with numerous flashbacks creates a more realistic length of time for Earl to grow, and the audience has been seeing that the whole time, 
since that's the premise of the series, so they can be a bit more forgiving of Earl in the past, or even people in the present who have yet to have undergone Earl's positive influence or gone on his journey. The passage of time needed to improve as a person feels particularly real when it comes to how Earl begins to mend his relationship with his father, Carl, played by Bo Bridges. When we first see them together, shortly after Earl has started his list in the episode Cost Dad the Election, we can see what a lifetime of Earl's bad behavior has done to their relationship. Earl is trying to convince his dad to run for mayor after Earl ruined his last campaign. You'll see I've changed. Later in the week, a cold Dad? Earl drags Carl back into another mayoral election, and while it looks like Carl might win this one, Earl accidentally screws it up again when he gets arrested for falling on a cop. But the real tragedy is that Carl just can't believe Earl is trying to do better. If you'll just sit down with me and look at my list, see what I've done so far, please? But that's not the whole story. He hasn't bailed me out in over six years. He's coming around, Randy. He's coming around. You know, I ran into John Shepard down the street. He said Earl came by and paid for a window he broke 15 years ago. A few episodes later, in Dad's car, we see Earl's efforts start to pay off when his attempt to return Carl's lost Mustang reveals that the car was meant for Earl, which has Earl putting himself on his own list. Earl doesn't just get the car, but the project of he and his dad putting it back together. And then it came to me. What I had cheated myself out of all those years ago wasn't a car. It was a chance to have some quality time with my dad. And now that I got that, I could cross myself off my list. Perhaps the sweetest part of their relationship is in the season 4 episode, Monkeys Take a Bath, where Carl finds out that his wife, Kay, played by Nancy Lenahan, cheated on him. After learning that payback isn't going to take the pain away, Carl and Earl bond over having been married to women who were unfaithful. The funny thing happens when the man you look up to your whole life breaks his own rules and cries. It finally gives you permission to. After a whole night of crying and more hugging than I'd like to admit, we discovered something unexpected. I think I feel better. Me too. Admittedly, this is pretty funny. It's also really beautiful. What Earl and Carla give each other in this exchange is freedom from the chains of a masculine repression of emotions, and they both learn the power of forgiveness. If this series is about Earl seeking forgiveness from others, this episode and this final part of his journey with his father reveal that he also needed to find a way to forgive others himself because sometimes even Earl is the victim. In this case, the victim of a society that told him he wasn't allowed to cry. And anyone raised as a boy can certainly relate to that. But don't you want to know what it feels like to score a touchdown? I'm pretty sure it's about the same feeling I got when I drove up and saw the smile on your face. Kay Hickey describes her sons like this. One of you's bad, one of you's simple. And Earl, you're bad. What am I? I would rather say that Randy is not complex, but that doesn't make him any less worthy of the respect and admiration one has for Earl. One of the first things we learn about Randy is how much he cares about his brother, and it's not so much that he needs Earl to babysit him all the time, but that Randy chooses to be with his brother. This makes Randy the perfect karma partner for Earl. Earl sums it up well in the season 1 episode, Monkeys in Space, when he says, If I'm gonna cross off all the stuff on my list, I'm gonna need you with me, not working as a busboy. Really? Yeah, think about it. You were with me when I did most of the things on this list. I mean, maybe you're supposed to be there with me when I fix them. Earl's appreciation of Randy, not just as a helper, but as a brother, is evident throughout the series. You get a real sense that they were always close, but if anything, working on the list has brought them even closer together. Particularly when Randy goes the extra mile to help Earl with his list, even if it means putting his own wants on hold. This is from the season 1 episode, Stole Beer from a Golfer. You were right, Earl. I shouldn't have been complaining, I should have been helping. Come here, Poochie. Thing is, I wasn't right. I was dead wrong. But Randy was too sweet to notice. Earl and Randy have a very sweet relationship. They're perhaps not typical brothers in that they sleep in the same bed and spend every day together, but they support each other in everything they do. Randy's ability to do good reinforces the point made about doing good being a relatively simple proposition. If Earl can do it, why not Randy? His whole character serves as an extreme example of one of the points I mentioned about Earl that doing good does not require some sophisticated set of ethics. In season 4's Got the Babysitter Pregnant, we get a sense of how far Randy has come when he fends for himself while helping someone on Earl's list. 
And since Randy now had a Randy of his own, he started feeling more responsible. Now I'm gonna start growing a mustache. You watch out for aliens and birds. That's what the number two does. Most people don't understand how important that is. With Randy having someone to look up to him the way he looked up to Earl, Randy starts living by Earl's positive example, taking care of the guy and trying to get his life in order. And Randy reveals just how much his adventures with Earl have changed him for the better. I just did the things I learned by watching you. Whenever you have something important to do, you put on a suit. And I was honest when I found that wallet, just like you would have been. Plus, I took care of my Randy. Although Earl does take care of Randy to a degree, it's important that this is a voluntary relationship and Randy does his job as well, taking care of Earl. I'm pulling that tooth that's been hurting you. You keep moaning in your sleep and it's making me have mummy dreams. Going back to the label of slow, we do need to address how Randy is often depicted on the show as being less bright than most of the people around him. In the season 2 episode, Harassed a Reporter, we see how some people view Randy when a news story covering Earl's list tries to tug on the heartstrings of the audience by putting Randy in a certain light. Out of all the good things Earl Hickey does now, the biggest one is taking care of his mentally disabled brother, Randy. A sweet but needy soul who can't take care of himself. When Randy confronts the reporter about how she deceptively edited the footage, she says it was revenge for all the times he ruined her live broadcasts in the past. And all I did was make you look stupid on TV. Just like you did to me every time I did a newscast, including yesterday. Sorry, Randy. What goes around comes around. It's karma, right? Randy, who had been feeling overlooked compared to his do-gooder brother, takes the reporter's words rather well. Karma noticed me, Earl. It made me look mentally disabilitated, even though I'm not. And if karma noticed me, that means I must be special. And I mean the good special, like you are, not the slow one. Randy may not be a genius, but his ability to look on the bright side here reveals a good heart and a mindset that doesn't let him get too trapped in self-pity. But more important is that his fear of being labeled special reveals how labels like that trap people. It would turn Randy into an object of pity and mockery, and he's so much more than what his grades in school were like. In other shows, characters like Randy don't get nearly as much screen time, unless they're there to be mocked with brief one-liners. And more than being a big part of the show, Randy has a really fulfilling life. He falls in love multiple times, he goes on adventures, and when Earl is incapacitated, he steps up for his brother and takes the list on himself. Randy gets to be a part of the show just the way everyone else is, and more so than just about every other character aside from Earl. Randy is definitely not common, but we don't need to label him with a condition in need of treatment. Being different is not always a medical condition, and Randy is still a valuable and important part of Camden County. Another big part of Randy's story, at least in the first two seasons, is his crush on Catalina. Randy's fixation here is a bit creepy at times, and a bit strange considering we see him date another woman within the time period he has a crush on Catalina. Even after Randy marries Catalina to deal with her citizenship issues, he still can't bring himself to be honest with her. And when he does, she only pretends to return his feelings. Catalina then takes Joy's advice to make herself as gross as possible so they can have sex and she can turn Randy off forever. And it works. Randy is grossed out, but Catalina suddenly regrets it because Randy is apparently great at sex and their roles are reversed, with Catalina longing for Randy and him being oblivious and uninterested. And then the show just kind of drops that whole story and never really brings it up again. The whole misadventure would feel strange not to mention, but perhaps it serves as an example of why certain plot lines are introduced and then dropped in the series. Personally, I suspect Randy's strength as a character is part of the reason this plotline got scrapped. He was so versatile and capable of so much that he didn't need a running premise to fuel story ideas. He got to generate them all on his own by being himself. Randy never really needed the crush on Catalina to make him interesting. He was always interesting. Ethan Suppley touched on this briefly in a panel discussion. I, I don't think Randy today. changed. He, probably he doesn't change. No. change at all. Randy six years ago is exactly the same. As we <laughs> Randy is always the same because the best parts of him don't really need to change. Sure, he grows and changes because of Earl's positive influence, but deep down, he was always a sweet guy with a good heart, and his unique perspective of the world let him see things that other people didn't, and sometimes that's all you need to tell good stories. As one example of a fun Randy-centered story, in season 4's We've Got Spirit, we find out that Randy has always dreamed of being a cheerleader. My name is Randy, and I like candy, and I like corn dogs. We see Randy take the lead, inspiring the other cheerleaders at the camp, 
and when it's finally time to perform, he goes out there and shows everyone what he's got, even if everyone in Camden only showed up to have a laugh. You wouldn't be smiling if you knew how stupid you look! We're gonna put this on YouTube as soon as one of us figures out how to use a computer! And this time, it's Earl who steps up to support Randy. Hey, bang, shoot, shoot, train. Come on, Camden, do your thing! The Camden squad wins everyone over. A nice touch in this episode is that, even though Randy is doing his own thing, it doesn't mean he doesn't need Earl to support him. If Randy's always backing up Earl, Earl can also do the same for Randy. I personally don't have a brother, but I know if I did, I'd want our relationship to be like Randy's and Earl's. Hello, my name is Joy Turner, AKA the Crustacean Sensation. Joy Turner is not an easy woman to love. She's rude, mean, and self-absorbed. In the early episodes of the series, it's almost as though she's been set up to be the villain trying to kill Earl so she can get his lottery winnings. But the series quickly readjusted and took some time to portray Joy in a more sympathetic light. At least a little bit. Jamie Presley's portrayal of Joy was a major standout early in the show's run. Presley was the only member of the principal cast nominated for an Emmy for her performance on the series, and she won Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Comedy Series in 2007. And my lawyer, who have been with me from day one for 13 years, here's to our little engine that could that finally did. It was well earned, and you can see Joy's role in the series expanding as they realized how good Presley was playing her. Hey, dummies. What are you guys probably sitting there saying stupid stuff, doing stupid stuff? <laughs> I'm gonna come too. Hold on. Maybe you should drive her home. I don't know, she might be okay. Damn it, who's sure they are drinking me? I'll drive her home. In an interview, Presley described the appeal of Joy as being an inner voice women wish they could channel. Believe it or not, I have women come up to me all the time saying, repeating all the line, the one-liners that, that Joy has. Um, because there's a little bit of joy in every woman that wants to come out sometimes. <laughs> But what made the character work, and seem so particularly convincing, was her gradually revealed range as a character. When Joy and Darnell get married in Season 1's Joy's Wedding, it becomes a list item for Earl when he drunkenly ruins it. There's a woman get married and you're gonna ruin it! <laughs> Things don't get too much better when, while planning Joy's dream wedding, Earl sleeps with Joy. Darnell is crushed when he finds out, and the wedding only goes forward when he realizes the full depth of Joy's feelings. When I told her I was going to tell you what happened, I saw a look of panic on her face I've never seen before. She was scared of losing you. She was scared? Joy. Terrified. And I've never seen that woman scared of losing anything. Earl is very much an early work in progress, particularly in these early episodes. And Joy represents something similar throughout the run of the series. Although Earl is an imperfect convert to karma, Joy is less impressed of the idea of karma. But as the series progresses, we very slowly, see Joy begin to change. It starts with her and Earl developing a real friendship. In season one's The Bounty Hunter, we see Joy realizing just how far Earl is willing to go to help her, keeping Joy safe from a bounty hunter, and the two put their marriage in perspective. We had a rough six years together, but there were a lot of parts I loved. There were a lot of parts I loved, too. In season two's Blow, Joy, finding out she has a half-sister, Liberty Washington, played by Tamala Jones, ends up with Joy becoming a surrogate for her. I might be carrying a baby soon. I mean, that if you would want me to, I need a surrogate. And by season four, Joy begins to check her own harsh behavior when she sees how it impacts her kids in the episode, Joy in a Bubble. Hey mom, check it out! You got these really cool water balloons that won't pop! Oh, they'll pop. If they didn't, you wouldn't have those two playmates there. It's not fair that they're gonna let some opinions they may have about me victimize my children. It's just not fair. Nope, it's not. You think I'm a bad mom? If you were a bad mom, you wouldn't be sitting in this car letting the boys enjoy a party with their friends. What makes for a compelling character is someone who changes throughout the story, whether they reveal parts of themselves not immediately evident, such as Joy's less abrasive side coming out, or if a character grows, such as Joy becoming more empathetic to the people around her. 
In the context of My Name is Earl, it speaks to the transformative power of doing good deeds that both of these things become more apparent as Joy is impacted by the good works of Earl, and even does a couple herself. Joy's life goes through some turbulent changes throughout the series. She nearly goes to prison in one season and ends up in the Witness Protection Program in another. But the real changes we care about are the ones inside her, the slow glacial changes that reveal that even this incredibly unlikable woman has the capacity to be better. Late in Season 4, Earl works to get Joy a spot on the TV game show Estrada or Nada in the two-parter Darnell Outed. Throughout the episode, we learn about how Joy dreams of being a celebrity, and she thinks appearing on this game show is her last chance at that dream. Her talents, though, are limited. These clouds are made for walking, and that's just what they'll do. One of these days, these clouds are gonna... When appearing on TV leads Darnell's assumed identity to be compromised, more on that later, they have to go into hiding. But Crabman risks it all to let Joy live her dream. You got the rest of your life to be Phyllis Rosenstein. You deserve one more chance to be Joy Turner. Time to find out if you're Estrada or not. And we see Joy show up that smug Eric Estrada. <laughs> Of course, none of that would have been possible without a few key assists from Earl, and we get an idea of how far the relationship has come. I know I might have divorced you and kicked you out of your own house and tried to kill you multiple times. But it all came out of love. I know, Joy. Joy and Darnell go into hiding for a few episodes, but when Joy is living the rich lifestyle she thought she wanted, it reinforces that she was already happy with what she had. They do return to their status quo of living in the trailer park in Camden, but even before all that silliness, we see in this two-parter just how much Joy has in her life. She has a husband who loves her, two kids who depend on her, and great friends like Randy and Earl. And her harsh exterior is made less bitter with that knowledge. And while she's still hard as nails, she can find the space to be happy and appreciate the life she has. Life doesn't need to dramatically change for her. All she needs is a willingness to see what she already has around her. That's part of the lesson Joy learns, and it's made possible because the people around her stopped doing bad things and started doing good things. Good works don't need to give someone a mansion. It just needs to give them a new way of looking at their life. And for the next two years, my name is inmate number 28301-016. My Name is Earl had a number of really strange episodes. There are brief scenes with live-action puppets of the cast. There are multiple episodes where the people of Camden are in an episode of Cops. And there's one fun episode where the opening credits get recut to feature different characters. But these are relatively short and self-contained. The most ambitious project of the show is, undoubtedly, its entire third season. Set up in the season 2 finale, The Trial, we see Joy, who had spent much of season 2 worried about going to prison after stealing a truck, finally go to trial. The evidence is tipping against Joy, namely recordings of a terrified Earl calling the cops on her from the time they were married. So. Earl, feeling responsible, does something drastic. I did it. <gasps> what? Ugh. My prints are on the truck. And look closer at those crime scene photos. There's two sets of tire tracks. One of them will match my El Camino. Earl sees this as a form of karma, a punishment for all the crimes he's committed, and he's sentenced to two years in prison. He even has to give up his list. And after two years of crossing things off, I even had to give up the list. On most other shows, this finale is a corner the show would have to write itself out of in the season 3 premiere, and we would see Earl leave prison at the end of the episode to get back to the usual status quo. Instead, My Name is Earl leaned into this idea of Earl in prison and reinvented itself for its entire third season. The third season can effectively be split into three acts. The first has Earl in prison, the second has Earl in a coma, and the last has Earl as a married man. That's obviously a lot to happen, so let's go through this season in more detail. Earl's life has been improving by working on his list, and as he's done good things, good things have come to him. There were always exceptions when times would get tough, and his faith in karma and the list was tested, but by the end of each episode, he was more or less through the worst of it. It wasn't until the beginning of season 3 that we see Earl face his most challenging test, going to prison. One of his first real challenges is finding a gang for protection. I'm just saying, I don't see why I have to shave my head. Hate's in your heart, not your hair. Forget it, I'm out. Earl finds a better way of surviving in prison by deciding to stay himself and keep doing good things for others. 
I realize that no matter how scared I get, I'm gonna survive in prison. I have to do it as myself. Because my name isn't inmate number 28301-016. My name is Earl. And while it makes his life in prison better, Earl is still left with the difficult question of how, even though he's doing good things, he's still trapped in prison. At first, it seems as though karma will reward him as his good deeds start leading him toward an early release, with the warden, played by Craig T. Nelson, shaving time off Earl's sentence for each time he assists the warden in some kind of project. Earl, you got six months and ten days left in here. Now you make this program work, and I will give you a certificate for six months off your sentence. But when Earl is getting close to his release, the warden screws him over. I don't know what I would do here without you to cover my ass. Well, I guess you're going to find out tomorrow. Thanks again, sir. A frustrated Earl resorts to making a prison escape. Unfortunately, the escape attempt is foiled, but when Earl finds out the warden formerly had a career in porn in the episode titled Early Release. Nobody needs to know about what you did today, son. As long as nobody finds out what I did in the 80s and... That little comeback in the 90s. Deal. Yeah. The resolution here doesn't quite work in Earl's mind. He responded to being screwed over by doing something bad, using blackmail. And now he was being rewarded for it. I didn't understand. Karma should have been kicking my ass, and instead it was rewarding me. And I couldn't explain it. First, Earl is punished for doing something good, and then rewarded for doing something bad. So what does that say about karma? In the next episode, Bad Earl, we see Earl revert to his bad ways, and he turns his back on the list. In this clip, Earl was filling in for a stripper, hence the outfit. I'm finished with the list. You can't. Something bad might happen. Look how many things I've crossed off. What do I have to show for it? Nothing. If karma was real, I'd have something good by now. Where's my good thing, Randy? Where's my good thing? The episode raises an interesting question of how doing good things can have a selfish motive. Earl wants a reward for his good deeds. As Earl behaves badly, he drifts further from his loved ones, and Randy tries to convince him to change back to good Earl with an earnest speech. I don't like this feeling I got in my stomach anymore. It's not like when we were helping people. So let's just go back to the way it was before. Because if you do good things, good things happen. Right, Earl? But it doesn't work. I did my list for two years, and the only good things that happened were for other people. If good things were going to happen to me, they would have happened by now, but they didn't. Good things are happening for other people, but for Earl, that isn't enough anymore. And he ends up right where he started in the first episode. There is no karma! Ha <laughs> ha! Oh. Okay, you're there. I get it. So you only punish me for being bad? <laughs> How about reward me for being good? Earl? And there it was. Good. Billy? When Earl finds out the person who hit him is Billy, played by Alyssa Milano, he finally believes he's found his reward. As a quick rewind, Billy is the ex-girlfriend of Frank, a buddy of Earl's who was locked up with him. Part of Earl helping Frank in prison was convincing him to let Billy find a better life without Frank's bad influence, and Earl developed a small crush on Billy, only to now be reunited when her car hits him. And then karma comes for Billy too. While in a coma, Earl enters a sitcom fantasy land. While trapped there, Randy figures out working on list items will save Earl, and so Randy does them in Earl's place. And eventually, Earl is rescued from his coma in the episode, Killer Ball. I was having this crazy dream. We were all real old. We had spent our whole lives together. That doesn't sound crazy. That sounds just about perfect. Earl finds Billy and the two get married, and even though Earl used the last of his lottery winnings putting on a prison prom, Billy has come into some insurance money of her own. So the moral of the story, at least at this point, seems to be that if you persevere with karma, eventually, through the people you helped, you will receive the reward of being married to Alyssa Milano. Except, the season isn't over yet. Over the next few episodes, we find out that marrying a woman because she was your coma fantasy doesn't quite work, and Earl realizes that he and Billy are a bad fit. She suggests the worst in the episode girl or earl you should lose the mustache yep you need to shave it i don't like her she's gotta go in the episode camdenites 
While struggling with Billy, Earl works on his list, crossing off Dee Dee, played by Tracy Ashton. The one-legged woman he ran out on was something of a running joke throughout the series, so it seemed like a big deal for him to finally be tackling this list item. He thought by helping her it would improve his relationship with Billy, since this was a woman he'd wronged and maybe that's the reason he was having bad luck with women in general. All Dee Dee wants is for Earl to understand her by walking a mile in her shoe. I am so sorry. I forgive you. You can cross me off your list. Although Earl thought he would be helping his relationship with Billy by crossing Dee Dee off his list, it doesn't really help. In fact, the only thing that really helps here is that Billy and Earl eventually separate, with Billy adopting a more rustic lifestyle, leaving her insurance money with Earl. So at the end of all this hardship, the only thing even resembling a reward for Earl is that he's giving the remnants of Billy's insurance money. Maybe karma didn't want me to be your award, but it still wanted you to have one. Two good things. And Earl is going to do what he was doing with his lottery winnings, and that's help other people. After I had spent time in prison, after I doubted Carmen, got hit by a car, after lying for a pretty good while in a coma, I had my list again, and I was finally back where I belonged. In addition to the fact that Billy being a reward is pretty creepy, as a person shouldn't be a prize to be won, the overarching message of this season is that Earl should not be doing good for any sort of external reward. He should be doing it because he's internally motivated to do good for others. In the first two seasons, you might argue that Earl still imagined he gets some magical reward at the end of his list. But the third season establishes that this journey may not end with some sort of grand reward. Rather, the reason to do this is not some fabulous cash prize like an even bigger lottery winning, but instead feel that personal satisfaction with his life, the joy that comes from helping others. At the end of season three, Earl's life appears the same on the outside, but on the inside he's grown into a better version of himself. He's now doing good deeds for a better reason. You might say that's still kind of selfish because he's getting a good feeling from helping others, but going from an external reward to an internal one, skipping the need for material comforts to get that good feeling, has shown Earl a simpler and more effective way of enjoying his life. And had the series run longer, maybe his drive to do good things could have been explored on an even deeper level. But sadly, this giant step in season 3 is the only one we get in the series. Structurally, the third season was also very different, when compared to how other sitcoms tend to tell long-form stories. In most other shows that have done similar things with season-long arcs, they're not quite as comprehensive as My Name is Earl's. Some examples would include the second season of Cheers, where we saw Sam and Diane trying to be a couple, the fourth season of Parks and Rec with Leslie Nope running for office, and the fifth season of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air with Will and Lisa falling in love. But the difference between My Name is Earl's season-long arc and these other shows is that while most other arcs featured change to a show's premise to create different dynamics in each episode, telling standalone episodes that simply reflect that new premise, My Name is Earl used a season-long arc to tell a much bigger, more complicated story. It tested Earl's commitment to karma and examined what really motivated him. It helped him realize the difference between a desire to do good and a desire for a reward. And Earl's understanding of that dynamic changes throughout the season as we see him in many different circumstances. And at the end of it all, he grows and evolves as a character in a way that you don't typically see in other shows. Season 3 did draw some criticisms from the audience, though, particularly the part where Earl was trapped in a coma. While referencing classic sitcoms within new ones is a cute idea, later on the show seemed to acknowledge that certain members of the audience weren't too keen on this meta joke. This is a clip referencing that in the fourth season episode, Inside Probe, Part 1. I had a dream the other night. I went to jail and I got out and got hit by a car and was in a coma. Me in a coma? Come on, man. Nobody wants to see that. And one interesting artifact of this season is that when the show had a lengthy break because of the writer's strike from 2007 to 2008, it came back with a recap ahead of its return episode delivered by NBC Universal CEO and president Jeff Zucker. But look who is driving the car. Alyssa Milano is nice. This weird intro was not well received and even led to a short article on Deadline, an entertainment industry outlet, asking if Zucker had lost his mind. It was actually Greg Garcia's idea to have Zucker do this intro, but 
Even so, the intro would be scrubbed from the DVD release. And before leaving season 3 entirely, I do want to highlight a surprisingly good trans joke. In fact, people have been calling me confusing my whole life. I'm not. That's why I'm going through with this whole surgery. Whole surgery? You think they'd have a fancier name for it? They do. It's called vaginal plasty. I think it's important to highlight that joke because, while there are other jokes in the series that are less kind, including the use of a transphobic slur, this good joke reveals a capacity to learn and improve from that previous bad behavior, just like Earl. Although it should be mentioned that a cis man in a dress is not good casting for a trans woman, so it's still very much a work in progress, just like Earl. And I have to acknowledge another moment in season 3 where Randy is encouraging some anti-Jose violence. You think anyone would mind if I take any carnations off of Jose's memorial in the yard? If anyone cared about Jose, he'd still be alive. <laughs> I took the skinhead's radio and I hid it in Jose's bed. <laughs> As a Jose, this anti-Jose nonsense is deeply disappointing and I hope the show will do better. Just do better. My name is, well, you better just call me Crab Man. There are a lot of flashbacks in the series. Some of them go on for nearly a whole episode. An early example being Season 1's Y2K episode where we see how Earl, Joy, Randy, Darnell, and Donnie, played by Silas Weir Mitchell, handle the impending technological apocalypse that never was. If the world's over, guess we're gonna have to start a new one. Any ideas on how to do that? Because it sounds complicated. My Name is Earl is a show defined by the past of its characters. Earl's past of wrongdoings is an obvious one, but in the case of other members of the cast, their pasts are also a big part of their characters. Catalina is a character whose past gradually gets revealed in the first half of this series. Not just that she entered the US illegally, but also that, before she became a hotel maid, she worked as a stripper at Club Chubby, a job she goes back to in the Season 2 episode, Jump for Joy. And in Season 2's Mailbox, we get a slow burn reveal where we find out Catalina has killed someone. I'm going crazy! I need to feel good about something before I kill someone again! This is followed up in Season 3's The Frank Factor. This is a nice example of continuity on the show. If Earl's story is about him realizing the impact of his past on his present, the same is true for other characters too. We learn more about Catalina's past when she's deported, and Earl and Randy have to rescue her in the season 2 two-parter, South of the Border. Although she's sent to what we're told is her hometown in Mexico, later on in the series it's revealed that Catalina is from La Paz, which is the capital of Bolivia. This is an example of the show playing fast and loose with its continuity. It's pretty common for sitcoms to place comedy over continuity, but it's a bit more noticeable in My Name is Earl, where a character's history is the basis of so much of what they do in the series, and the show certainly doesn't help itself with the many flashbacks it includes. That all said, there are enough consistent facts to make sense of these characters' history. Regardless of whether it's her home country or not, Mexico is where Catalina is deported to. And Randy marries Catalina so she can come back to America. Of course, as we already talked about, it doesn't work out for them. And it's around here that Catalina's character seems to drift around a bit, as if there was no definite plans for her. While she's a fun addition to the cast and an interesting character, the key to making her interesting is often done by exploring her history. We see this hold true for Darnell as well, a character who is very mysterious in the early seasons, as the only clue we get to his history is that he's in the Witness Relocation Program and his name used to be Harry Monroe. It isn't until the show's fourth season we finally get some answers as to who Harry Monroe is in the two-parter Darnell Outed. While, as mentioned earlier, a lot of this two-parter is dedicated to Joy trying to show up Eric Estrada and prove she can be a celebrity, what complicates the plan is Darnell appearing on national television and having his cover identity blown. Now that's why you were advised to leave Camden when you had the chance, so you wouldn't get mixed up with people like her. That's my wife you're talking about. You were only supposed to be in Camden for six months. Now if you'd taken that job we had for you in Tokyo, you would have been the one who invented Dance Dance Revolution. In My Name is Alias, a few episodes later, we get a more complete answer as to who Darnell is when his secret agent father, played by Danny Glover, comes to make amends with him. From an early age, Thomas saw that his son was exceptional. So, like any good secret agent would, he shipped his son off for spy training. Darnell left his life as a government assassin when he was asked to kill a child. When he testified against the agency in front of a subcommittee, the agency wanted revenge, and Darnell had to go into witness protection. 
While this history for Darnell wasn't planned from the beginning, the show's creators always knew he'd have a wild backstory. Some of the theories were that like he accidentally saw an alien or there was all kinds of different things or he went into a room and found uh, George Bush playing poker with Osama bin Laden or just there was all kinds of nutty things. These revelations do contradict the fact that we saw Darnell's family in the season one episode, Joy's Wedding. Though that's explained away as them being other people in the witness protection program. Both Darnell and Catalina are their most interesting when their pasts confront them in the present. Along with the show's many flashbacks and Earl's quests, this is how change over time is represented in the series. And it gives the impression that these characters are more rich and detailed than what little we may see them do within the context of an episode. There's always the subtle suggestion that there's more to these characters than meets the eye, and some part of their past is just waiting to leap out from the shadows. Catalina and Darnell are both similar to Earl in that, they're happier in the present because of the choices they've made to live happier lives. They certainly aren't perfect, but the worst conditions of their past are a reminder of why they chose to leave their old lives in Bolivia and as a secret agent, respectively. They were miserable in both places. Much like Earl making a list of wrongdoings and making up for them, the changes Catalina and Darnell make were a challenge. Leaving a life behind, no matter how you do it, is always difficult. But part of this show's optimism comes from that willingness to make a try against difficult odds and the courage it takes to remake your own life. A TV show came to film in Camden County, and we were lucky enough to be on it. Bad boys, bad boys. Camden County is one of those fictional places in a TV show that never gets a precise location in the real world. The closest we get to any confirmation is that it definitely is not the same Camden County in New Jersey. Its local accent and a complete lack of snow at Christmas time suggest it's somewhere in the southern U.S., but it's hard to be more precise than that. We can contrast it to the vaguely named Big City in the Season 1 episode, Stole P's HD Cart, where we see Earl struggle to get any justice from a big corporation trying to muscle a local hot dog cart out of Camden. Business is tough, son. You try to play by the rules, but sometimes you can't. And when you can't, it's better if I can stand up in court and say I didn't know about it. And Earl learns an important truth. Those corporate executives are criminals, Randy, like we used to be. Only they're worse because they don't admit it. It's hypochronical. I mean, hypoconjugal. Hypothetical? This episode has a fun message about how corporations exploit labor and that real restorative justice involves going Robin Hood on a big corporation. But there's another larger message here about how the people of Camden, especially Earl and his friends, exist outside the world of white shirts and ties. This needs to be understood as not a complete rejection of living in a society, as we see Earl learn the value of having a functioning government in the season one episode, Didn't Pay Taxes. Maybe the government doesn't always just see people as bad or good. Sometimes it just sees people who need help. Earl's vision of a more just world is one where people help other people, and the world of big business, represented by the big city, is a rejection of that ethos. It embraces selfishness and the exploitation of others. Camden doesn't feel like a real place because it operates on such a heightened sense of reality, which is probably why it doesn't feel unrealistic for Earl's change of heart to have such a wide ripple effect. But it cuts in other ways too, such as in the season 2 episode, Van Hickey, where Earl's longtime friend, Ralph, played by Giovanni Ribisi, threatens to kill him. Seems like there's only one fair solution. I'm gonna have to kill you. <laughs> kill me? Don't take it personal, believe me. Nobody's gonna miss you more than me. Ralph, you're not really gonna kill me. You're gonna kill me. The impact of this dynamic is explained well in the DVD audio commentary for that episode. Now, you know that in the life of the show, we're not gonna kill Earl, but you do believe that he's going to try to kill him. Camden is a place where some scary stuff goes down, and you can believe characters when they say they're gonna try to kill someone. But in that heightened sense of reality, there's also the possibility to do some good. As we go through the series, Earl's good deeds create new friends wherever he goes, helping shape the community into one where everybody helps each other rather than compete against each other. But this isn't just a rejection of the capitalist mindset. It goes a step further by presenting Camden and Earl's social circle as a meeting place for all types of people. One of the most rewarding things about writing for Earl is that you get this wide palette of characters from Camden. Camden County is a town of misfits, and that's the kind of people I'm drawn to. In season two, with the episode Sticks and Stones, we get a great example when Earl tries to make up for teasing a girl who had facial hair in school, and then finds himself in a small community of circus performers. Oh my god, you know what this place must be? A cartoon? No, I think it's where all the cartoons people live when they aren't working. I'm doing it again, Randy. I'm making fun of people because they look a little different, just like I did with Maggie. 
Look, karma brought us here for a reason. I mean, what good is it to cross Maggie out the list if I'm going to keep doing the same thing to other people? As Earl learns more about the performers as people, he also learns to identify with them when he's reminded he was teased for having hairy nipples as a kid. The episode ends with Earl facing his fear and going off the high dive with his shirt off, and he's joined by the performers who refuse to hide away in their private community. It's about learning to have some pride, even if you're a little different, and that we're all a little different in our own ways. It's a pretty basic message, but the series is more than just bringing in people for an episode to say, hey, they're decent people too. A lot of these characters appear again throughout the series, much in the way Kenny became a series regular after the premiere. These characters don't just show up to teach Earl a lesson, they become active members of his community. We see another example in Season 1's Teacher Earl, where Earl teaches English as a second language to make up for all the times he's made fun of people with accents. How about Nescobar? A lop lop? Erections lasting more than four hours while rare required immediate medical attention. Having him watch TV as homework wasn't working out. Actually, something ironic here about the actor who plays Nescobar Lop Lop, Abdoulaye Ngom, he actually speaks at least five languages. Or six, depending on who you believe in the DVD commentaries. Or maybe seven if you believe everything you read on the internet. Although the depiction of some of these people borders on the offensive, the series seems to develop in its depictions of these characters the same way Earl learns to be more sensitive to people who are different. Much like the circus performers, Nescobar becomes a regular in the series in a lot of fun and creative ways. We had to have a translator for the translator. We will prove Joy Turner is guilty. My bad. Not guilty. I'm sorry, my Mandarin is a little rusty. When the series begins, Earl's concept of us is just him and Randy. But as it progresses, that us grows to include so many more people, not just the obvious additions of Joy, Darnell, and Catalina, but also the people he would place in the very undesirable bucket of them. And importantly, not just to Earl, a lot of these people who become part of the us label are often marginalized by society with little access to power keeping them perpetually trapped under the label of them. Immigrants and people born a little different have every right to be a part of our communities. Any us worth making is one that includes these people too. In the season 2 episode, Our Cops is On, we get a sense of how big the us is getting with numerous cameos from the people of Camden. A nice bit of subtext in this episode is that, even though their lives and relationships weren't being improved by Earl and his list, since the episode predates it, it does show us that they were all in community with one another already. They were just either strangers or hostile to one another. The fact that they're all sitting here laughing, drinking, and watching this episode together reinforces the transformative nature of doing good deeds and the impact it has on the community. In the season 3 episode Camdenites, when Earl has to untip Joy's trailer, which he drunkenly tipped over a few episodes earlier, he's assisted by all the people of Camden he's helped out over the years. When I was doing bad things, no one would help me with anything. But now that I was doing good things, I had lots of friends willing to pitch in. And they prove that by working together, they can make their whole community a better place. And that doing good is infectious. Now, everybody just calm down. On May 14th, 2009, the final episode of My Name is Earl aired, although it wasn't meant to be the finale. Titled Dodge's Dad, the episode centers around Joy finding out that Dodge, her eldest son, isn't actually the son of Little Chubby, played by Norm Macdonald. It turns out that Earl, who raised Dodge thinking he was another man's son, is actually Dodge's biological father. No. Yep. No. Yep. Earl, did you do me? If anything, you did me. I was drunk. This is one of the dangers of hooking up at a costume party. But even more shocking than the Dodge revelation is that Earl Jr. isn't actually Darnell's son. These three DNAs match. That means it's you and the boys which makes this one mine, and it doesn't match any of those. What does that mean? It means I'm not Earl Jr.'s father. And the last line we ever hear from the series is Joy saying, Now, everybody just calm down. And we got a giant message saying, To be continued. Only, it wasn't. Although My Name is Earl premiered to very strong ratings, it gradually slipped as the seasons rolled on. For its fourth season, it had fallen to 62nd place in the ratings, far cry from its debut at 22nd. But it is strange that it was cancelled while other NBC shows such as Chuck and Parks and Recreation, both with lower ratings, were both renewed. 
whatever the reason, going into that episode, creator Greg Garcia was under the impression that this would not be the final season. Caught completely flat-footed, the only sign that this might be the final episode is the production company tag at the end where we see a partially shaved Jason Lee. Even that suggests that maybe they're not entirely done yet. After being cancelled by NBC, there were talks with several networks to pick up the series, with TBS being a strong contender. But ultimately, the cost of the series to fulfill its creative vision was just too much for any other network to sign on, and so Earl's ending would remain, at least for now, untold. In a 2013 Reddit Ask Me Anything, Greg Garcia was asked how the series was meant to end. This answer remains our best look at what the future held for Earl Hickey. We never really got the chance to fully figure it out, but the talk in the writer's room was that Earl Jr.'s dad was going to be someone famous, like Dave Chappelle or Lil Jon, someone that came to town on tour and Joy slept with. But when we got cancelled, we never got the chance to figure it out. I was worried about doing a cliffhanger, but I asked NBC if it was safe to do one at the end of the season, then they told me it was. I guess it wasn't. I had always had an ending to Earl, and I'm sorry I didn't get the chance to see it happen. You've got a show about a guy with a list, so not seeing him finish it is a bummer, but the truth is he wasn't ever going to finish the list. The basic idea of the ending was that, while he was stuck on a really hard list item, he was going to start to get frustrated that he was never going to finish it. Then he runs into someone who had a list of their own and Earl was on it. They needed to make up for something bad they had done to Earl. He asks them where they got the idea for making a list and they tell him that someone came to them with a list and that person got the idea from someone else. Earl eventually realizes that his list started a chain reaction of people with lists and that he's finally put more good into the world than bad. So at that point he was going to tear up his list and go live his life. Walk into the sunset a free man with good karma. Hey, pizza man. Hey, Smokey Floyd. There are some interesting postscripts to My Name is Earl's cancellation, such as the show not being the only thing that was cancelled. Anyone who purchased the first DVD set of the series would have seen this fancy little flyer advertising a My Name is Earl comic coming from Oni Press. When asked about this, Greg Garcia explained that this project was abandoned because he would have lacked the creative control over it he would have liked. One project that followed My Name is Earl that did come to fruition was Garcia's next series, Raising Hope. Garcia described the inspiration for the series saying, The main inspiration for Raising Hope was the anger over the fact that they cancelled My Name is Earl. I wanted to do another single camera comedy so I could quickly hire the same crew that I had loved working with for four years. I was interested in doing a domestic comedy so I thought of the most twisted way I could of putting a baby in a house full of people that had no idea what to do with it. In addition to bringing back his crew, a number of cast members from My Name is Earl made cameos throughout the series' run. There were also some cute nods to the abrupt cancellation of My Name is Earl, such as one of the characters on Raising Hope revealing that they were a fan. Which one is from NBC? Oh, that's for canceling My Name is Earl! That was eight network presidents ago! I loved it! It would take a whole video to list every reference to My Name is Earl on Raising Hope, but I did at least want to mention the season 3 episode, Making the Band, which almost felt like an alternate reality episode of My Name is Earl. Turns out, Bert and Virginia didn't really want the rock and roll lifestyle as much as they thought they did. They realized their place was in Natesville raising their granddaughter. And that's more or less that we got from the residents of Camden County following the show's cancellation. Jason Lee did say in a 2020 interview that he was interested in giving the show a proper wrap-up, though so far no concrete plans have emerged. While working on My Name is Earl, Jason Lee also starred in the first Alvin and the Chipmunks live-action movie as Dave Seville, a role he'd reprise in its various squeakquels. He also appeared on The Memphis Beat and Up All Night. He's largely stepped away from acting in recent years, though he's expressed interest in reviving older projects he's worked on, such as Mallrats and, of course, My Name is Earl. Eden Supley has appeared in a number of roles on TV and film after the end of the series, including roles in The Wolf of Wall Street, Dog, and The Ranch. In 2014, he reunited with former My Name is Earl co-star Jamie Presley in the series Jennifer Falls. Jamie Presley has worked on a number of projects following the cancellation of My Name is Earl. In addition to the short-lived Jennifer Falls with Ethan Supley, Presley also appeared on Welcome to Flatch, I Hate My Teenage Daughter, and she appeared on seven seasons of the series Mom. After My Name is Earl, Eddie Steeples appeared in the TV series The Guest Book and the movies Hot Seat and Jiu Jitsu, currently scheduled to appear in the upcoming movie Fallen Cards. Since My Name is Earl, Nadine Velasquez appeared on the series The League, 
and the movies Snitch and Flight. Most recently, she appeared as a part of the principal cast in the ABC series Queens. My Name is Earl is an unfinished story of redemption, and in a way, that story could never be finished. Throughout the series, we see Earl make right the wrong deeds of the past, but we also see him make mistakes along the way, having to add new items to his list. It's likely that the work on the list will never be completed, and the desire to be an ideal person is not going to be completed by Earl himself, but will have to be a quest picked up by the people around him. As you can tell from that imagined finale from Greg Garcia, that was the whole point of the series, that doing good doesn't end with some ultimate reward waiting for you, but rather doing good makes the world a better place, and that doing good inspires others to do the same, with your reward being able to be part of that better world you all share together. It expands the idea of doing good from a solitary exercise to something more communal. We aren't waiting for an Earl to come save us, because we can all start on our own lists right now, and we can all make the world better together. The cancellation of My Name is Earl will probably always sting because there's so much more growth we could have seen in the series, and ending with a cliffhanger is usually not a good way to leave off characters. Even if Earl was never going to finish that list, we could have at least seen his new struggles with fatherhood, or Darnell's changing relationship with the boy he thought was his biological son, or even just Joy tracking down Earl Jr.'s real father. These are the lingering questions that could use a few more episodes or a movie to wrap up. But four seasons is a lot more than most other shows get, and in that four there's still a lot of good stuff to be found about the value of trying to be a better person. And it's the trying that's the key. No one will ever be perfect, and Earl certainly never is. But his example shows us that anyone, even a dirtbag with no education and a lengthy rap sheet, can try to make the world a better place. All it takes is believing in karma and starting with a list. This will probably come as a surprise to anyone who's watched these retrospectives, but I usually don't have to go out of my way to find a series. Most shows that are classics are found streaming pretty much anywhere, and special features and documentaries and whatnot are take a bit of digging, but can be found with some effort. My Name is Earl was the first time I actually had to track down physical media in the form of old DVDs, basically doing a lot more work, just so I would have as much information as possible to put together this video. With that in mind, I would like to extend an extra special thanks to my patrons. Because of their support, I was able to do this without any serious financial burden. And you can see their lovely names going up the screen now if you would like to join them and have early access to videos like this and also finance some tougher ones that take a bit more effort to put together. You can join my Patreon. In addition to getting your name in the credits, you'll get early access to videos, plus lots of other fun bonuses and extras as they come. If you would like to support this channel in a non-monetary fashion, you can like, comment, subscribe, or hit the bell for notifications. And if you're thinking about what kind of comment to put below, how about what is the first item you would put on your list of bad deeds you need to make up for? Thank you all so much for watching.